morning, everybody. <coughs> Give me great pleasure to welcome all of you to this round table. <coughs> and a very special welcome to Dr. Narendra Jato. Barely a month ago, he was here in Mumbai uh, to participate. He gave the valedictory at uh, a seminar on higher education organized by the Higher Education Forum at the Wellinger School of Management. And uh, he's here again. <coughs> it shows Dr. Jadhav's deep interest and commitment to the subject. He has been piloting reforms in higher education very vigorously ever since he became member of planning commission recently <clears throat> and uh, to use his own words this particular bill <clears throat> is going to bring about historic transformation in governance of higher education in India and we are going to listen to his, uh, his uh, views in the inaugural address Gathered in this rather small hall are some of the most distinguished representatives of the academic community in uh, Mumbai and Pune. We have representatives from uh, TISS, IIT Mumbai and also IIT Kanpur, TIFR, Mumbai University, SNDT, Pune University, College of Engineering Pune, Symbiosis Institute, MET, MEDC, MIT and also some individual activists in the field of uh, education. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Atanu Dev from Pune, Dr. Urjit Patel, Krishan Khanna who has been uh, who has been championing the cause of uh, education reforms for years together. <coughs> so, special welcome to all of you. As my colleague said, uh, we are just waiting for uh, another distinguished participant, Shri Sahariya, Secretary Higher Education, Governor of Maharashtra. Oh, he's here. <coughs> Friends, uh, let me say a few words about uh, our foundation. The Observer Research Foundation is uh, a public policy think tank. Research Foundation is a public policy think tank, uh, very well established in Delhi, has been in existence for 20 years. Uh, ORF has also organized uh, many activities in the past in Mumbai. But we have uh, decided to revive and rebuild ORF in Mumbai on an institutional basis. And we are happy to uh, have uh, put together a very dedicated, competent team of uh, researchers and activists in a short time of three, in a short time of three months. Uh, <clears throat> we have chosen in Mumbai six areas for research and advocacy, education, public health, urban renewal, inclusive and so sustainable development, youth affairs and youth development, and last but not the least, <coughs> protection of our priceless heritage in arts and culture. 
in the past three months, we've had uh, some really good events here. We had a round table on the water crisis in Mumbai. We had uh, an event focusing on uh, mental health as a public health challenge, focusing especially on uh, strategies for suicide prevention, because as you know, in the past few months, there were many reports of even students committing suicide. We had, uh, we have taken up, our transport group in ORF Mumbai has taken up a uh, study of uh, a complete transformation of uh, Mumbai's suburban railway system, improvement in Mumbai's uh, bus transportation, because public transport is an area of uh, major commitment for us. Last Sunday, we had a day-long seminar on the need to promote information and communication technologies in Marathi and uh, other Indian languages because we consider that it is very important for marching towards the goal of inclusive development. We've had, uh, we've started a series of uh, lectures, public lectures in the area of science. We have titled it Gurus of Science and we were very fortunate and privileged to have uh, begun this series with a lecture by Dr. Shaw Mary Lane, a Nobel laureate. He was here two months back and delivered lecture and had very interesting interaction with uh, uh, students. Our <coughs> colleagues have uh, done a study which gives me, you know, great sense of fulfillment friends they've just completed a study on uh, sanitation in Mumbai's suburban railway network our suburban railway system is the lifeline of Mumbai this is where the Indian railways took birth unfortunately uh, so many things need to happen to make our suburban railway system world class and as part of our overall engagement with uh, public transport we have done this study and it is soon going to be published. So you will see that uh, we have a very, we have taken for ourselves a very broad mandate. You can say it is a 360 degree mandate for uh, a public policy think tank. Today's Roundtable Friends is our first event in the area of education. I cannot think of a better <coughs> definition, if you will, for what education means and what education should do than the words of Swami Vivekananda. Education is that which is for man-making, nation building and advancing the universal progress of mankind. I believe that higher education should be guided by and should be evaluated by these wide word, wise words of Swami Vivekananda. Higher education should enable us to create a healthier, more cohesive, more caring society at the same time, higher education should be relevant to India's needs. It should be divorced from the real needs, the real requirements of India's development. Unfortunately, that's not the case. I'll give you just one example. I'm, I happen to be uh, an advisor to the railway minister and uh, I was shocked to find that we don't produce a single PhD in railways in India, whereas China produces more than 100 each year. Which is why China is going to now build high-speed 
train networks in the United States. Our higher education should help India build better cities, manage our cities better. There should be high, higher education reflected in municipal governance, in the way we do waste management, in the way we take India closer towards food security, energy security, water security. Higher education should help India find livelihood for millions of young people. So we felt that uh, we should take higher education as a major area of activity for war at Mumbai and we have begun this engagement with uh, the round table today. All of you agree that this is a very important bill and I am happy that the Ministry of HRD has sought feedback from the public <coughs> and uh, Dr. Narendra Jadhav has taken keen interest, keen personal interest in getting the views and comments from people all over the country. He is going all over the country to participate in events like this. I think that this participative democracy is very, very important. At the end of today's roundtable, friends, we are going to put together the views expressed by all of you and uh, give these views as our feedback, the feedback of war at Mumbai to the central government and also to the state government. We've had some initial discussion with uh, Sri Saharia at his office recently. We are also going to meet the governor of Maharashtra who is the Chancellor of all the universities in Mumbai. So thank you very much for participating in this event and I am sure that we will have very stimulating, very meaningful discussion today. Thank you and with these words I invite, uh, uh, I am told that Sri Saharia has to leave early because uh, the state assembly is in session. Okay, good, good. <laughs> so we have uh, the pleasure of listening to Dr. Narendra Jadha. Over to you, Sri Jadha. Thank you. Thank you, Sudindra. And good morning, friends. It's indeed a great pleasure as well as an honor to be here this morning. Uh, at the very outset, I would like to congratulate uh, my friend Sudindra Kulkarni for having taken this initiative to organize this uh, round table on a subject of great contemporary relevance. Uh, I would also like to take this opportunity, as, uh, as Sudindra mentioned, uh, this is the first program of the Foundation uh, on Education. Uh, I must take this opportunity to also congratulate Sudindra and his team for uh, reviving this Observer Research Foundation. And uh, there was a great need for a forum where intellectuals can come together and talk about issues uh, uh, which are of wider relevance. So, uh, I am very happy that uh, Observer Research Foundation has become now a, a very important forum for people to come together and talk about the issues and uh, have informed discussion on subjects of contemporary relevance. That said, uh, let me turn to the subject. We are uh, going to talk about, uh, this is a round table on uh, draft National Commission on Higher Education and Research Bill, NCHER. Uh, while I am going to focus mainly on uh, this bill, uh, let me begin by putting the bill in perspective because this bill is only one, most important one, but only one of the major changes which are taking place and will take place uh, over the next two year period. Let me start with the dramatic statement. What we have today is truly history unfolding. In the next two years, the entire higher education system in our country is going to be completely, completely reformed. And this new system that is being put in place is going to be something that will remain for 30, 40 or even 50 years uh, to come. So NCHER must be seen as a part of this new and evolving architecture for higher education in India. Uh, and 
lots of things are happening and therefore you must see you must see this as a part of the overall effort uh, the vision for this entire new and evolving architecture has not been articulated uh, what has happened is that while NCHR bill is something which is put on the website there are many other changes which are taking place which are not uh, so far have not been put on the website uh, the cabinet uh, notes have gone cabinet has approved and they are waiting to go to the parliament uh, so I will not be able to talk about the details of each one of them but I want you to have a perspective on uh, the different initiatives which are going on uh, five of them there are nine in all together but five of them are most important they are the ones which are changing going to change the face of higher education forever and I dare say that at no time since independence so many reforms were taking place at the same time you look at our 60 years of, of, of uh, development of higher education sector or broadly education sector you show me any point of time where so many metamorphic changes were taking place at the same time therefore what I'm going to do is that Keeping in mind the NCHER bill at the center, which is the queen of or, or centerpiece of all these reforms, I want to give you a perspective on vision. What are we trying to do? What is the direction in which higher education is moving? And what are the kind of changes which are going to take place in the next one and a half to two years? But take my word, in next two years, the Indian higher education system would be unrecognizably different than what it has been and the number of reform, the amount of reform that is going to take place is going to be more than what has happened in the last 60 years. That said, uh, let, me, let me start with uh, emphasizing the importance of higher education in our country, importance of education. Uh, Sudhindra mentioned uh, Vivekananda's uh, timeless quote on the importance of higher education. Uh, in the current context, I, I think the importance of education is even more than what uh, Swami Vivekananda said, uh, as uh, Sudhindra mentioned. Uh, the importance comes from the fact that we are at a critical point of time in our other nation. We are at a critical point of time where we are on the cusp and we are moving in the direction of becoming an economic superpower. We are talking about 8.5% uh, 8 8 growth rate next year. We, you know, we... Uh, we were growing at the rate of 9.5% on an average for three years before the global economic crisis hit us. After the crisis, it shaved off a couple of percentage points from our growth and we are now back on the recovery path and we are hoping to go between 8 and 9% next year and 9% uh, plus in the terminal year of the plan, that is 11-12. And after that, we are talking about moving into 10% trajectory. Now what is driving this growth? It is generally understood and there is a lot of talk and you have all heard about the, the so-called demographic dividend. Demographic dividend is a reality. If you just look at our population, uh, in the age group of 10 to 19, uh, we have 225 million people. In the age group of 10 to 19, this happens to be the largest cohort of young people making a transition to adulthood. Not only largest across the countries not only largest for our country over a period of time this is the largest cohort of young people in the history of humanity so in all our existence of humanity this is the largest cohort that is making a transition to towards uh, adulthood 10 to 19 um, years age 225 million people now this is giving us a great advantage in terms of average age of India being only 24 where and even in the year 2020 our age average age is supposed to become only 27 or 28 whereas in 2020 the average age of China and United States would be 37 uh, Europe would be 42 or 43 and Japan would be even 48 so we have this great advantage of relatively young people and this gives advantage in economic terms as well with the youngest labor force that we have we certainly will have a comparative age over other countries uh, but there is nothing automatic this does not mean that our large and growing young population would automatically propel India to become an economic superpower the key there the crucial element there is education and skill development if we do not I have been saying this uh, ad nauseum that if we do not put our act together in terms of education and skill development not only we will not become an economic superpower but uh, the demographic dividend that we are talking about will actually become a demographic nightmare 
and that is why importance of education is uh, today the education sector is more important than ever before uh, so that is the first point that I want to make let's take a look at uh, the higher education sector that we have today in our country uh, you know not too long ago we used to boast that India has the third largest uh, technical manpower in the world it's all nonsense because we don't look at it in terms of the absolute number. Because our population is large, you know, the numbers are going to be big. What is important is, do we have adequately trained manpower potential uh, to commensurate, to be consistent with the high growth trajectory that we're talking about? If we're talking about 10% growth, do we have enough people, uh, technically trained manpower? The answer is regrettably not. Um, the, if you look at the education system in India, we have 400, latest data is 499 universities, 25,951 colleges, and the total enrollment of students in higher education, higher and technical education at the national level is uh, 1.5 crore. This is certainly looks very large. The faculty strength all over the country is 5.22 lakh. So we are talking about 499, nearly 500 universities. We are talking about 25,000 odd colleges, uh, enrollment of 150 lakh students, and faculty strength of 5.22 lakh. This looks very, very impressive, but it is not. Uh, to see, uh, the, to evaluate, what, what are the major problems that the higher education system uh, uh, is having right now? We can evaluate, what, I can give you all these numbers, but. Uh, they are, they are incidental in a big paper that I'm writing. They will come out in, uh, very soon. But the point that I'm trying to make is that let's start by evaluating the higher education system in India today. Uh, looks very big, but is that good enough? Is the size good enough? Is the quality good enough? One has to look at, evaluate the education system at least in four different aspects. First is access. Second is uh, uh, the equity, equity aspects. Uh, third is quality aspect. Fourth is employability. And fifth is uh, affordability. So these are some of the dimensions that we must see. Just look at, let's start with the basic one, access. You know, we think that we have very large university system, third largest in the world after United States and China. How good is, is it? Or how, how uh, is that large enough for a continental country like India? The answer is no. If you look at the access, uh, typically the access is measured by the gross enrollment ratio we all know in the age group of 18 to 23 what proportion of our population in the age group of 18 to 23 actually have access to higher education the latest number is only 12.4 that means out of every hundred youth uh, only 12 of them have opportunity to go for higher education is that large or small it is incredibly small today the India's GR in higher education is only one half of the world average. It is only two thirds of the average of even developing countries. So, you know, this notion that we have that we are way ahead of the world, absolutely wrong is the answer. Our GR today in higher education is half of the world average, which is 24%. It is two thirds of the average for developing countries which is 18%. China's case is very telling. Uh, if you look at China and India, uh, as far as the GR is concerned, you know, uh, just in the eight years ago, nine, nine years ago, in 1999, GR of China and India were same, 6%. In 1999, India GR in higher education was same as China GR, which was also 6%. Uh, but in the eight years, while we have inched from 6% to 12.4%, in the same eight years, China has taken its GR to 22%. So 10 percentage points above, uh, above India. And looking at China's population, that 10% means incredibly large number of people who have access to education, higher education in China today. And in India, we don't. Uh, this is an important thing. Uh, Another social dimension, this also is extremely important in my view, and I emphasize that, equity consideration. If you look at GR, as I said, GR in India is very, very poor, 12.4. Now you break it down, break it down in terms of various social groups, break it down in terms of rural and urban, rich and poor, uh, break it down between male and female, 
break it down between scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, minorities, and what is the picture that we get? This 12.4 is very impressive. If you look at look at the internal distribution, let me tell you the worst case. Ask yourself a question: What is the GR of poor rural scheduled tribe female? Now I'm taking the extreme group. There, the GR today is 1.8 percent. I do not think there can be anything more shameful than having very large social categories having access to education at 1.8 percent. What are we talking about? We are talking about becoming an economic superpower, and your GR overall GR is one half and one third of uh, one half of uh, the, the, the world average. And you break it down, your GR in certain large sections of society being less than two percent. In my view, there is nothing more shameful for a country. It doesn't augur well, but that would be a mild statement. I would say there is nothing more shameful for a country which is hoping to become an economic superpower. So I want you to have this dimension in mind. Uh, the third dimension is quality. Quality is a difficult concept to measure, but there are different ways it has been measured. We have NAC evaluation done of all the institutions. NAC came into being in 1994, and it's now 16 years old. Uh, how much is the accreditation uh, that has been done? They made accreditation voluntary, not compulsory, not mandatory. And uh, how many uh, institutions have they finished? Rough and ready proportion. Rough and ready proportion is that uh, uh, I have the data for March 20, 2008. Out of 417 universities that existed at that time, only one third were accredited by NAC in 16 years. I don't think that is an impressive thing at all. That means that before you finish the first round of accreditation, all institutions would be due for second and third round of accreditation. So it cannot go on. If you see the results of accreditation, they will be eye-opener. If, if you see the gradation that they have done in terms of A and B and C, uh, very few universities and colleges fall in the A category. Most of them are in B and a very discomfortingly large number of them are in the C category. Now these are something, these are only indications of the malady that we are facing. So the quality, the, we, we are leaving much to be desired, uh, much is left to be desired as far as the quality is concerned. Uh, look at affordability. If you look at affordability, we have this very strange sort of caste system in uh, educational we have central universities, then we have state universities, then we have deemed to be universities, we have private universities, uh, and they, they are all very different. And their, their conditions are different, their charges are different, all kinds of things are happening there. But if you see the cost structure that is emerging, for very large number of, particularly the private and deemed to be universities, is so high that it is virtually keeping a very large mass of society from having access to higher education. So in principle access is there, but effectively the access is denied because of the exorbitant charges that they are making. Uh, so affordability is also an issue. Employability is of course uh, the most important issue involved there. Uh, there is the rift, and this I was talking about this ad nauseum in, uh, when I was the Vice Chancellor of Pune University. Uh, there has been, over, over a period of time, there has been a growing rift between uh, what the kind of education that is imparted and the kind of societal needs that are emerging. You know, they have been diverging and the gulf has been widening over a period of time and uh, this has really raised the question about the relevance, very relevance of what we are teaching in our colleges and in higher institutions. Uh, particularly, you know, the, the simplest expression of that is that a young person who is just graduated if he or she is given a job by a good employer, what is the chance? Is that person capable of becoming functional and useful to the company right away? The answer is no. Even in a field like IT, it takes 8 to 10 months of training by the company before the person becomes useful to the company. And by the time that happens, the person is, because of the poaching, he moves on to other companies. The point is that the education, there is a rift between higher education and the changing societal needs, changing industrial needs has been widening and this is another area of concern. Survey after survey have shown, can you imagine one third of our engineers, at least one third of our engineers are completely <coughs> unemployable. They cannot simply be employed. 
And you know, when I give these statistics, one third is the minimum. There are people who are saying that there are surveys which have shown that only one third of employable and two third of unemployable. That is a very sad commentary on the quality uh, and the employability aspect of our our higher education. So all this needs major change. National Commission on the Higher Education Research is one of the way to address that. But if I want to list out, if I want to list out the systemic challenges which are there, what are the systemic challenges that the education, Indian higher education system uh, is facing? I would like to divide them into three categories. One is uh, the challenge of expansion with inclusion. Second is academic reform. And third is reforms in the regulatory framework. So let, let me just uh, give you a quick rundown. These are the major system issues that I see facing that we need to address if we really want to take our high, higher education sector to the so-called 21st century education. Expansion with inclusion. There are at least five issues there. Expansion and upgradation of infrastructure and facilities. Two, reduction of regional, social, gender and income imbalances. Promoting distance education and convergence. Greater private involvement including through PPP and permitting entry of top class foreign universities. This is part, as I see, the expansion with inclusion. Academic reforms. What are the kind of academic reforms needed, imperatively needed? One is revision in curricula and improved pedagogy. Uh, pedagogy. Uh, semester system, credit-based courses, examination reforms, competency enhancement of faculty, uh, promotion and upgradation of research. On each one of these, you know, one can talk for half an hour because each one of them we are lagging so way, way behind. Competency of, I will just take one example to show you. Competency enhancement of faculty. It is my considered view that more than 50% teachers in our colleges and universities do not have foggiest idea, foggiest I am saying, of the recent advances in their own subject. How many teachers have, have I seen even in progressive state of Maharashtra and in an excellent university like Pune University, there are hundreds of teachers who go to class with the guide. They, they teach from the guide. Can, or, or there, there are many who use what I call American yellow pages. The notes that they had taken when they were doing their MA and MSc, they is being still used. They do not, they are not aware of the kind of change that is taking place. This is a sorry state of affairs. And the academic staff colleges that we have, let me say this, uh, Saria sir. I have said that before, I want to say this. Academic staff colleges that we have is a cruelest possible joke. Nobody takes it seriously. You know, in the whole government report, you will see that we are taking adequate care and precaution, teaching our teachers, you know, updating the knowledge base of our teachers. Nonsense is the, is the answer. They are the, the cruelest joke. And we need to do a lot. This is only one example. There are in each one of this. One can support that with the data and, and bring out the enormity of the problem, enormity of the of the mess that we have created. Third category is the reforms in the regulatory framework. Now this is very, very important and this is really the focus of our subject today. Providing autonomy to universities, ensuring accountability, quality improvement including through accreditation, Reducing multiplicity of regulatory agencies and improving effectiveness of regulation, prevention of malpractices, and providing an effective adjudication mechanism. Now, these each one of them again requires a big essay, but these are the challenges that uh, we have. Now, how are these challenges being addressed? That is the issue that we are going to discuss now in the, in the third stage of. So there, I would like to say that all these challenges are being addressed at various levels, but there are, in terms of reform of the system, there are five important legislations which are at various stages of approval. Most important of them is uh, NCHER, National Commission on Higher Education Research, uh, which is the main subject. But the second one, you know, I, I would like to uh, talk about other ones also and then spend enough time on National Commission for Higher Education and Research. Uh, in addition to in addition to that, <coughs> we have uh, in addition to NCHER bill, uh, we have uh, a, a bill which has been approved now by the by, by the uh, cabinet, which is the uh, which is for prohibition of unfair practices in technical and medical educational institutions. 
then the other one is uh, a bill to provide for mandatory accreditation of higher educational institutions and creating a regulatory authority for that purpose. Then the fourth one there is, uh, is uh, the provision for creating uh, tribunals at the state level and at the central government level. And the final one there is of course regulation of entry and operations of foreign educational institutions. I think the basic reform in the regulatory structure must be seen in the context of these five, NCHER being the main one. Then we are talking about tribunals, we are talking about accreditation regulatory authority, we are talking about unfair practices, uh, prevention of unfair practices, and we are talking about uh, the foreign education providers bill. Now, uh, what are these other things doing? I cannot tell you exactly what they are doing, but just to give you a sense of what they are attempting, uh, I will talk about other four first and then focus on NCHER. Uh, as far as uh, the other bills are concerned, take the case of uh, tribunals you know we there are there is no mechanism the mechanism that we have for adjudication and uh, every vice chancellor present here uh, including college i will tell you the enormous number of complaints and disputes that uh, the vice chancellors have to address incredible amount of time is spent and uh, that also happens to be our uh, favorite pastime complaining and in pune in fact they used to complain with the legal point one two three you know giving references and every day you receive just huge bunch of complaints everybody is complaining about everybody else and you know vice chancellor or chief executive cannot possibly give attention to all that and go through that process so this whole thing is going to be shifted to the tribunals at the state level and a tribunal at the central government level and we wish good luck to them because they do not know what they are going to be facing i have seen that so that's one part uh, regulatory authority, uh, the, 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 the accreditation regulatory authority. As I said before, NAC is there, but in the 16 years of its existence from 1994 to 2010, they have barely covered one third. So what this new thing will do, two things, the National Accreditation Authority will do two things. A, accreditation will become mandatory. This is the most important change that I can, nobody can claim to have uh, uh, an educational institution which is not accredited. So then accreditation would be done and it would be put out on the website for anybody to see. So it's no state secret or anything. Every institution, transparency and accountability is going to be the hallmark of the change that is taking place. So national accreditation, uh, so there would be accreditation agencies appointed and the rules for that will be made by this accreditation uh, uh, authority which will be a regu regulatory authority for accreditation agencies but uh, uh, accreditation will become mandatory right now it is not and there are many institutions which have no incentive to go for accreditation because they cannot make the claims that they are making and uh, subject themselves to accreditation so this is the kind of thing that that will happen that's the third one fourth one is malpractices and malpractices there are just far too many and many of you know those uh, even better than I do uh, but I can I can tell you that that uh, there can be a whole list of uh, uh, malpractices including can you imagine today we have UGC doesn't even know how many institutions are there which are unauthorized and institutions can make any claim about uh, their standing and never it is never challenged because there is no authority which will challenge that. So, you know, it is it's a complete anarchy. What we have is a system where anybody can go to town and say whatever. They, if you see the advertisements made by many uh, fly-by-night operators, you know, and routinely people in thousands, you know, desperate people go to them, spend money, and then it becomes litigation. You know, this has to be stopped. But there is no malpractices. There is no act which will prevent those malpractices. So uh, that act is also coming. These are the these are the other changes. And then foreign educational institution providers bill. This is again a very important one. Uh, this means that the foreign institution, foreign educational institutions, would be allowed to come in and establish their own campus, um, either on their own or in collaboration with the existing university. And uh, this is for the first time that the guidelines have been clearly laid out. This whole thing has always been very, very opaque and I don't think it was by an accident that it was opaque. 
because there is a rain to earth if it is not opaque and not transparent and that is precisely what is going to be changing now. That brings me to the main issue about the NCHER bill, uh, National Commission on Higher Education Research. Uh, all of you undoubtedly are aware of the fact. Let me explain the background and then talk about the major provisions. We are not going to go uh, section by section, but a perspective on what is being con contemplated under NCHER. Uh, the background of this is that uh, there was a very influential uh, committee appointed, then uh, Sir Vijay Kole was part of that. Uh, uh, this is uh, the, the, the famous uh, Yashpal committee report. And then there was uh, Sam Petrora's National Knowledge Commission. Both of them have given uh, their recommendations. One recommendation that stands out, the one assessment by both reports is that the Indian higher education system is over-governed, sorry, over-regulated but under-governed. You know, there are, there are too many regulators, but the level of governance is very low. So we have this paradoxical situation where there are too many, uh, too many, there are too many, there are too many, there are too many, regulators but there is uh, very little governance this is this is the bane of the higher education system now if you look at uh, even the, the multiplicity of regulators we have UGC then we have AICTE then we have NCTE NCTE is the National uh, Council for Teachers Education then we have professional council for uh, pharmacy for architecture for medical science for every subject we have and then we have bar council for law so we have 15 different regulators and again those of you who have been in the administration of higher education would know how much time that you have to waste running from pillar to post going to all of, all of these and these are these have been very very difficult organizations to deal with uh, again they have been very friendly with some and there are motives attributed which are not entirely unsubstantiated uh, as, uh, as we have seen uh, the point here is that there are all these regulators and this myriad, myriad of controls and regulation that was created that in turn created a kind of caste system between uh, the central universities, state universities, then uh, the, the deemed to be universities, then we, you all know about the, uh, the, 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 the uh, examination of the deemed universities and uh, government taking this bold decision of actually de-recognizing 44 of them this is uh, this is a tough tough decisions are being made so uh, with these regulators what has happened and the harmony harmony between them or synergy between them is virtually zero non-existent non-existent each one of them has a, has a turf of its own which they will guard zealously uh, and then you know the amount of time that the university vice chancellors have to spend dealing with all of them is is completely unproductive and undesirable and that is something which needs to be changed. So one of the common recommendations that was made by both uh, Yashpal Committee as well as the National Knowledge Commission was to come up with an apex body, a overarching apex body regulatory authority. Uh, Yashpal Committee called it uh, National Commission on Higher Education and Research. Uh, the National Knowledge Commission called it ira -Hey, Independent Regulatory Authority. Uh, ira -Hey was the, uh, on higher education, so ira -Hey. uh, this has been accepted uh, by the government and on 4th June when the uh, Honorable President of India made a speech before the joint session of the parliament, she said that the government is committed to establishing National Commission on Higher Education and Research uh, on the basis of recommendations made by uh, National, by, by recommendations made by Ashpal Committee as well as National Knowledge Commission. Uh, she talked, unfortunately she talked about two different authorities, you know, it's, the recommendation was for only one apex body where everything is put together, but the Honorable President talked about two bodies, one for medical and other for non-medical, that has created its own problem, but that we are trying to sort out. Uh, but the idea is to create uh, a big body which will, where all these individual regulators will be subsumed. This is the idea. The word subsume created again a lot of discussion, but it's generally understood that what it means is that UGC will cease its separate existence, AICT will be closed down, NCT would be closed down, and they will be in some form merged with the National Commission on Higher Education Research. This is the proposal. This has not happened, but this is the direction in which we are moving. 
what the government has done is that the Honorable Prime Minister appointed a task force and I am part of that task force uh, to implement the recommendations of the Ashpal Committee and that task force what you see the focus is on transparency and accountability. So first thing that we did was for one month we had intensive meeting and there are there are seven members in the task force. We had series of meetings, the brainstorming sessions and we have arrived at a draft legislation for creation of National Commission on Higher Education Research. First thing that we did was to put it on the website for anybody to see. That is where Sudhindra comes into the picture saying that let's talk about it. So it is there for discussion. Not only we did that, uh, this was done uh, somewhere uh, last month. Um, having put it on the website, the task force had a meeting with all the regulators, all the councils together and they were given kind of one last chance to present their case for UGC and AICT and everybody was called, you know, everybody is given a final chance, right? So before uh, they are closed down, they were, they were given a chance to come and present their case. Um, and after that, we are, we are going through a kind of series of regional consultations. The task force has gone to every part of the country. Uh, in six places, at least in the south, I went personally. Uh, so Bangalore and Chennai and uh, Trivandrum and Ahmedabad and Pune and uh, Ahmedabad, Pune and Bhopal. These were the six places in south, uh, southern, south of India. Then in the north, uh, our people went to the northeastern region. Some members went, I couldn't. But uh, North Part, Rajasthan, Delhi, uh, some places I also went. So we had series of meetings there and we have taken, this was a regional consultation uh, actually suggested by the Honorable Prime Minister himself. So we are right now going through all this feedback and making changes. The idea is the draft that was put out, you know, nowhere it is pretended that the task force is the fountainhead of all the knowledge uh, or all the wisdom so to say. So that is why it is important to get feedback from the stakeholders. But we cannot have boat club kind of meetings. So focused meetings of uh, uh, stakeholders who are professionals, um, that is the series of that has been concluded and uh, we are right now going through the feedback that we have received. That feedback would be taken on board, uh, whatever is acceptable will be taken on board and then this proposal would be revised and this revised proposal will be the basis of the cabinet note which next month will go before the cabinet and once cabinet approves hopefully by uh, November or December uh, it will come for uh, discussion in the parliament with all other four bills uh, that I mentioned they have already been approved by the, uh, by, by the, by the cabinet and they would be uh, all the five bills All these five legislations will go before the parliament and once parliament uh, approves that in whatever shape and form, it would become a reality. But the bottom line is very clear. Government is very keen on doing it and they are pushing it ahead and in an unprecedented manner. That brings us to the specific National Commission on Higher Education Research. What is the purpose of this? You know, uh, we have received very interesting feedback. And I certainly hope to receive very, very important feedback from this gathering as well. And that is why I am very happy that Sudhindra has taken initiative to, to organize this. Now, what is, what, what is the uh, National Commission for Higher Education aiming to do? First of all, the, the guiding principles, if you see, of National Commission on Higher Education Research, first of them is promoting autonomy of universities for free pursuit of knowledge and innovation. This is the most important thing which has not come out as well as we wanted in the draft bill and it will be changed. Uh, but promoting autonomy of universities is the most important part of this. Uh, then the second, promoting accountability. We all know that autonomy must necessarily come with accountability. So there would be promoting accountability through a peer group consisting of persons of uh, eminence. Then promoting transparent and participative governance in higher education. This is again very, very important. Uh, and fourth one guiding principle is mechanisms for identifying leaders of higher educational institution. Read selection of vice chancellors. And we know the kind of debate that has taken place here and elsewhere, particularly in Maharashtra in the recent times. 
So these are guiding principles are these four. How are they going to be achieved? You know, please note that well, what would be the structure of NCHER? There would be a seven member body, there would be a chairperson and in the, that old form which may be revised, uh, three full time members and three other non full time members. It would be basically a policy formulation and standard setting body. It has only one regulatory function, contrary to the impression the newspaper articles and EPW articles, many of them are based on uh, inadequate understanding. Uh, of, there is only one regulatory function that uh, NCHER will take over, that is authorization to, to give degree or diploma, uh, authorization to degree or diploma granting institutions to commence academic operations. So any state can start any number of universities uh, with the state act, but whether or whether they are eligible to commence their operation is something that would be decided because I can show you many examples where state governments have approved universities with three faculty members and two and a half research staff and uh, inadequately completed buildings. You know, this, this is uh, uh, not something which happens in Munnabhai. This is a reality. In, you know, in, in fact, in, I have come to realize that many things in our higher education system closely resemble the Munnabai uh, model. And uh, you know, one, one example that you know, the, the typical UGC kind of uh, UGC kind of uh, uh, inspection that takes place, or uh, the committee is going. You know, the, the whole thing has become such a such a such a scam. And there's one example that I can give, even, uh, I, I don't want to name the institution, uh, the story is that in, in the medical college, when the team went, everything was hunky-dory, there were lots of doctors, students, uh, patients, and uh, everything going hunky-dory. And one of the members, you know, they were all very impressed by what they saw. Naturally, they were going to write a very positive report. One of the members, unfortunately, forgot his uh, cell phone in the, in the office. So three hours afterwards, he went back and he found that there were no patients. And there were no students, no doctors, nothing. Nothing was there, exactly like Munabai. The idea was, he even spoke to the people there. You know what the locals told him? At least on that day, we get free medicine because we have paid money to go there and lie down in the hospital. And then, then we are also we are, we are given money and we get free, free medication if we want. So that is, you know, this is going to be changed completely. And I can also say that credibility of our regulatory authorities, particularly UGC and AICT, has never been lower than what it is. You know, uh, when we have been debating with people, a lot of them have said that, you know, what you must do is, you know, where is the need to create something new? Why don't you just revise the UGC Act and make it better? You know, this would have been valid 15 years ago. Now things have gone too far and things have reached such a low level of uh, governance that what we need is not not tinkering here and tinkering there. What we need is a complete overhaul and that is what government is committed to doing. Now I am going to talk about, so what NCHR will do is the only regulatory function is authorizing degree diploma granting institutions and there are two executive functions, funding higher educational institutions and recommending names of vice chancellors. Both of them are very sensitive. Funding of higher educational institutions. Uh, it is generally understood, and this has been pointed out by many, particularly the most effectively, it was pointed out most effectively by my friend Kaushik Basu when he gave uh, a, a rejoinder uh, or a dissent note to Yashpal committee. What he said was, UGC was given these both functions, grant giving as well as regulation. What happened was, very little attention was given to the regulatory aspects, grant giving became the main thing, and in that process, you know, they were mixed in such a way that it was nothing but a new license Raj that came into being. That you, you convince them whichever effectively works and then things will happen. You know, so it was nothing but a license Raj and that had to change. Uh, so this, there is a lot of merit in what, uh, what, what they have said. If you see the funding of educational institutions, there are many state university people here. Let me make one thing very clear, you know, and this needs to be told. And I have said that specifically in the paper. In spite of all the talk, the mainstay of 
of our higher education system is state universities. They are the least talked about, but they are the mainstay because 87 percent of our students go to state university. So if you look at central universities, which again talk a lot, state universities no talk at all, deemed universities lot of talk. They are the ones who are really vocal. Private universities they are the really one the vocal. But in the totality of things, what is their contribution in terms of number of students? All of them put together about about 13 to 14 percent. In any case, less than 50. So main stage state university. How much money, you know, somebody is going to conduct a study about how much money has gone from UGC to state university? They have never been favored. One classic example I will give. Mumbai University is an exception. Pune University is an exception. Under UPE, the university with potential for excellence, they did give fairly large amount of money. But generally speaking, central universities have virtually no budget constraint. State universities, no money at all. One example, last year, somebody gave this example, one southern state, all state universities put together, how much money did they get from the UGC? 17 crores. And there is only one central university, which incidentally, NAC has given a B grade, got 275 crore. So there is this caste system, which is embedded into our system, where central universities will not have any money money constraint. Other universities are charging, uh, you know, uh, deemed to be universities, they, they, they are well funded and they, they take care, good care of themselves. State universities, which happen to be the mainstay, have been completely ignored. That will change. The new funding pattern that will emerge will be based on normative funding. It will be a normative funding done by NCHER. It is not being done by HRD, it would be done by NCHER and certainly not by, by, by UGC anymore. Uh, that brings us to the issue of a point. Uh, yeah, there are two concepts which I want to mention here. NCI, the one criticism was that these seven wise men or women who are there, are they going to run the whole show for uh, so many years? Is that fair? Right, it's not fair. They would be supported by two things. One is collegium. Collegium uh, is a concept that has been introduced. Collegium of scholars. In Gujarat, somebody suggested a very interesting word for that, Acharya Kul. So this, what this collegium will do, first of all, people in the collegium will not be selected. They are self-selected. You know, they have given categories. The, you know, those who are Nobel Prize winners, those who are uh, in certain category, you know, the, uh, national research professors, there are 12 national research professors. So they are all self-selected. They will form the collegium. Collegium will have a role to play. Then there would be in addition to collegium, there would be there would be core members, non-core members. I don't want to go into all those details. But the point is, these seven men or women are not going to be running the whole show. There would be there would be a collegium of scholars, and we are now thinking about a separate general council as well. But that is something which may appear in the next draft. The biggest complaint, you know, this has been received fairly well. Of course, uh, we accept everything with uh, uh, tongue in cheek. But one very strong criticism that has come about NCHER is that this is going against the principles of federalism. That this is going in the reverse direction. This is centralization of all powers at the uh, central government level. And this is not fair. Most states have been saying this. That is that true? I asked the states, and since Arya Saab is here, uh, do we have any, do, does, do the states have representation in the UGC as of now? No. Do they have representation in AICTE now? No. Do the states have representation in NCTE now? No. Then what are you complaining about? What is being removed from you? At this stage is to create a national registry. National registry will be created. No infringement or no violation of the state acts, please note Sariyaji, no violation of the state act, there would be a national registry maintained, individuals who think that they are capable of becoming vice chancellors can apply and they, their names will be scrutinized and those which are approved are going to be put in the national registry. If the universities think that their four or five people are capable of becoming vice chancellors, they can nominate them. Those would be scrutinized by NCHR and put in the National Registry. States, if they insist on four or five 
whomsoever they insist. They can propose the names. What will happen is that it is only through the scrutiny of NCHER that those names will be actually there in the National Registry. So what would be obligatory on the part of the state government? According to the State Government Act, for example, take the Maharashtra University Act of 1994. According to this act, there is a provision for a search committee and the search committee must make search and uh, this time they went for applications, etc. That all will not be, the search committee will be there. But what search committee will do is to look at the national registry which is maintained and they can take any five names from that search committee, can take any five names from there and look at those names and if one of them is found suitable, they will recommend it to the chancellor and the chancellor can take the final decision. If they don't like those five names, you know, after evaluation, they can ask for another five name. So, that it is not restricted, it is only temper. The days of son-in-law and nephew or niece or you know of, of the chancellor, chancellor of deemed universities becoming vice chancellor, those days hopefully and mercifully are gone. What will be done is that the names which are nominated and approved by the NCHER to put on the national registry, anyone that can be chosen. Some people complain that you know, our state would be flooded by, you know, in Pune, as always, in Pune we were told that people from Bihar will come as a vice chancellor. I said, because the contrary, you know, Maharashtrians will go to Bihar as the vice chancellors if they are willing to go, of course. So, what will happen? What will happen is that there is no consideration there. The selection committee job, in fact, would be facilitated by a list of 2,000 names which are available. They can pick and choose anybody. But here, some states are unwilling because this they think it is their right, whomsoever, a person who is not even a BA or, or there are cases where uh, a person with a BA degree has become a vice chancellor of a medical university. You know, where if he happens to be son in law of the, uh, the founder, this is something which is very natural and this is happening. Those days are gone. They have to, they can recommend anybody, including state. Those names, only those which are scrutinized and found suitable would be put on the national registry and the states would only have the obligation to take the names from those 2,000 names or names which will be there and then make up their mind. The search committee can make up their mind. That is going to be the change and that is not the most important point, the final point that I am trying to make is that this is not going against the principle of federalism for the simple reason that what we are doing or what the government is doing is to in fact go a step further in decentralization because while to some extent the authority of the states is tempered, tempered the authority is being given to the universities directly the autonomy you know this has not been highlighted in the bill properly needs to be done but this is the most important thing at any day at any day those who are vice chancellors and those who are running the universities certainly know more about running the university than a babu sitting in mantralaya of that same, same government. This is the self-evident truth and this has to be done. So while to some extent the, temp, the, the authority of the state is tempered, the authority is now passed on to a stage further to the vice chancellors. And I think this is a huge step towards decentralization. The complaint that from the states is because they think that their authority is restricted. Vice chancellors should get fullest possible autonomy. They do not have to run to the state government. They do not have to run to UGC and AICT and spend time doing that. They have to simply run their institution. All the inspection Raj is over. You know, the, the kind of visit uh, that is all gone, will be gone if this is approved. What will happen is that there would be a total ex, uh, disclosure based verification. All universities, you know, they will be given complete authority. And when I say authority to the university, autonomy to the university, this is autonomy to the vice chancellor, this is autonomy to the deans, this is autonomy to the heads of the department. They will be, and, and they have to do what they are doing in a completely transparent manner with information disclosure. There would be no visits of the team giving the report. So the Pakit Sanskrit Pakit Sanskrit, that is what it's called. You know, every time this committee goes, there's an envelope given to each one of them, in addition to everything else. 
uh, and those things are fancy. So all that is gone. No, there will be no inspection. There would be verification of the information disclosed. There would be fullest information disclosure. And if somebody is making a wrong claim in the disclosure, which turns out in the verification, then there would be a strictest possible punishment coming from the tribunal on the fast track. That is the whole idea. The idea is to trust them, give them autonomy, but make them accountable. And if they are disclosing information in the wrong way or giving ads about their universities which, uh, which can tempt many people, but those which have no semblance with reality, no connection with reality, they will be uh, possibly booked. So that is the whole idea. So we are moving in the direction of a massive change in the next one and a half to two years. There would be all kinds of changes which will take place in a democratic setup. Uh, we expect uh, all kinds of opposition, counter uh, arguments. It is only when the parliament approves all this. And I am certainly very optimistic uh, that the parliament will approve this with some modifications. But in whatever shape and form it comes, this process, in my opinion, would be completed in the next 12 months. And after that, all these institutions would be, would be established. And that will, final point that I want to make is that it is very important for all of you to understand the kind of changes which are taking place. It is only when, if you are adaptable, you know, uh, to, if you adapt yourself suitably to these changes which are taking place, then alone you can survive and indeed thrive. Those who don't will be fallen wayside and nobody will have tears to shed for them. So I think Kulkarni Sahib has done a salutary uh, service, a very important uh, service by bringing all of us together to discuss uh, our concerns about the evolving changes uh, which are taking place, which will help all of you to decide your own, design your own strategy to deal with this change in a manner that will benefit yourself and the institution that you represent. I thank uh, Sudhindra for giving me this opportunity to come here and talk to all of you. Thank you very much.